What a gift it is to hear the church, the people of God, lifting your voices. I, I could just say, standing down here in the front and hearing the, the anthem of the church being sung around this place is just a tremendous encouragement to me. It's, it's a gift to be reminded as we sing of who our God is and what he has done for us. It's a gift to remind one another as we sing collectively and corporately that, that our God has, has done great things, that our God is worthy and he is holy. And as we turn our attention to his word, we're, we're gonna see this again together. The, the word of God is living, it is active, it, it leaps off the page into our lives to remind us of who God is and what he has done. So let's, let's do that now. Let's, let's grab our Bibles. If you would grab a Bible and join me in 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. We've been walking through Peter now for quite some time. And as we continue in this series, we're, we're going to see what the Word of God lays before us, divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter to, to challenge the church. This is a letter to the church saying, church, in light of the gospel, in light of what Christ has done, you are called to, to live a certain way. And we see this today in our text, 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. So I'd like to invite you, if you're willing and able, to, to stand back up with me as I read from the Word of God. And, and we stand to be reminded that this is our foundation. This is what the church is built upon. And, and when we turn to God's Word, we are seeing this living, active Word reveal to us what God says is right and good and true. Listen to the Holy Scripture, 1 Peter 4, 7. The Word of God says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever Amen. This is the word of the Lord. And before we're seated, I, I want to pray very simply that God would use this living, active word to lay before us today what he knows we need to hear. So let's, let's pray to that end right now. Father, as we come before you, as we turn our attention to this living, active word, this word that is alive, this word that, that cuts through joints and marrow to the heart of the matter, this word that reads us and knows who we are and knows what we need to hear. I pray, Lord God, that you would have your way among us. As your Holy Spirit moves among this place and among those who are hearing your word, it is my prayer that you would show us precisely, exactly in this moment that you have sovereignly set apart from the beginning of time for us to have an encounter with you through your word. Show us what we need to see. For Heavenly Father, we all come into this place needing to hear from the living God. We all come into this place carrying heavy loads, carrying heavy burdens, walking through challenges, facing circumstances of uncertainty. We need to hear from the living, sovereign, reigning God who knows exactly what we need. So we ask you to speak into our lives as only you can. Have your way. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing with me. As we have been making our way through this great letter of the Apostle Peter to the early church, we have seen time and time again that there is this theme 
that Peter is pointing the church back to as he says, church, in light of the gospel, in light of what you've been given, in light of what Christ has done for you, You are called to live a certain way that stands out in the world around you. We've talked about this term over and over again that's used in chapter one, elect exiles. That's the way Peter describes the church. He's saying, church, you have been chosen for such a time as this by God to live as a stranger in a foreign land. You are to live as one who is different from the world around you because of what Christ has done for you. We've seen Peter talk about this as it relates to uh, our relationships with one another. We've seen Peter talk about this as it relates to our families. We've seen Peter talk about this as it relates to how we endure hardship and, and navigate suffering and interact with those who disagree with us or even come against us. And today we see this as Peter is reminding us that this life is short. He's reminding us that that every day that we have been given is a gift. And Peter is saying to the church, church, you are to view your life and your time on earth and the days you've been given different from the world around you. Verse seven makes this statement that, that really is a sobering statement. Peter says that the end of all things is at hand. Sounds kind of like a a scary statement, uh, maybe a a fear-inducing statement, a depressing statement. Hey, the end is here. What is Peter getting at? What we see here is very significant because theologians have talked about this and written about this for generations. The word of God is reminding us here that from the moment Jesus Christ ascended into heaven to sit at the right hand of the Father, the, the moment Christ went up to be with the Father after the resurrection from the, the, the grave, we entered into what theologians call the last days. The last days. The last days are from the ascension of Christ to the second coming of Christ, to the return of the king. So we are living right now in the last days. Now you may say, well, we've been living in the last days for 2,000 years. And Jesus hasn't come back yet. So why should we be worried about it? Why should we be even thinking about it? If it hasn't happened in 2,000 years, why would we even talk about it? Well, I can say this statement very confidently before you today. In these last days, we are closer to the last day than we have ever been. Am I going too fast? We are closer to the last day than we have ever been. And equally as important, we must consider, you and I are closer to our last day than we have ever been. If our last day occurs before Christ returns, either either way, we are closer to that final day. So the question is, are we living in light of that reality? Think about Peter's perspective here as he's writing this letter. Keep in mind, Peter is is one of the apostles. He's one of the first disciples. He he spent time with Jesus in the flesh. He witnessed the miracles of Jesus. He heard the teachings of Jesus. He heard Jesus talk about eternity. He heard Jesus say things like, in my father's house are many rooms. He heard Jesus say, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And where I'm going, you can't go right now, but I will return and I will take you there. He heard Jesus say, I'm I'm coming again. And then think about this. I mean, this has been something that has struck me over and over again as I've studied and prepared in this series, thinking about Peter's letter and what Peter witnessed. Everything that Peter is writing about here to the early church, he's writing about based on what he saw when he walked with Jesus. He was there at the ascension. He saw the resurrected Savior. He saw him lift off and go into the clouds. 
And he certainly remembered the words of Jesus that I'm coming again. I'm going to return. I'm going to take my bride. I'm going to take my church to be with me. One of the, the great joys that, that, that Megan and I have experienced, one of the things we love about going to Israel, uh, where we get to study the word of God in Israel, is you get to go to the Mount of Olives, the place that overlooks the city of Jerusalem, the old city, where, where Jesus is going to return. It's absolutely incredible. You can stand in that place and, and you see there are, there, are, there are graves all over the mountainside of what is called the Mount of Olives. And those graves are there. This is really important to consider. Those graves are there because the Jewish people believe it's on the Mount of Olives that the Messiah will come and, and will touch down. They, they don't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. They believe the first coming of the Messiah will happen at the Mount of Olives. And so the, 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 those who have had means throughout the years, financial means, those who have been the wealthiest, who were able to acquire a, a plot of land on that mount, they, they have their cemetery there, their, their burial there, their tombstones there so that they can be there when the Savior comes. We, through the word of God, who are followers of Jesus, who believe that Jesus is the Messiah who will return. We believe that's the site of the second coming where Christ will touch down on the Mount of Olives. He's coming again. And so Peter, who heard all these things and witnessed all these things and saw Christ ascend into heaven, after hearing Christ say, I will return again, Peter has this urgency. He has this urgency that he's saying to the church, live with expectancy. Live with an eye fixed on eternity. Know that this life is short. This life is brief. This life is temporary. And be prepared for that day in how you live. He's writing to the church saying, live with this sense of expectancy. And the Bible makes it clear. What, what has taken place in these last days? It has prepared the way for the return of the king. And no one knows when this is going to take place. The, the Bible says over and over again, be expectant. The Apostle Paul writes it this way, 1 Thessalonians 5. He says, it's going to happen like a thief in the night. You're not going to know when it's going to take place. So be ready each day. I'm going to quote from the great theologian Willie Nelson here. <laughs> he sings, live every day as if it's your last one, and someday you're going to be right. An interesting statement, a profound statement from a crooner. Live every day as if it's your last one and someday you're gonna be right. There is coming a day, more rapidly than probably we want to admit, a day that we're closer to than we've ever been before that will be our last day. Are we living in light of that reality? Peter is saying to the church, divinely inspired by the Spirit of God, Embrace this reality, church. Embrace the reality that the end of all things is at hand. Embrace the reality that life is short and none of us know how many days we have been given. Embrace the reality that each day is a gift. And as Peter says this, he, he makes a very important statement to the church and this is where the church is to, to be different from the world around us. Peter says, in light of the reality that the, the last days are at hand, that the end of all things uh, is at hand, be self-controlled, be sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. What is Peter saying? Well, my translation here is don't freak out. That's the GSV, the George Standard Version. Don't freak out. Why? Because what are we prone to do when we're shaken, 
when we're reminded that life is short, when we have a near-death experience or we get a diagnosis that came out of nowhere or we watch events unfolding in our culture that shock us or we see a catastrophic event take place and we're reminded of the brevity of life, what do we often do? We freak out. And we get overwhelmed by fear and we get overwhelmed by anxiety and and we get overwhelmed by worry. And and Peter is actually saying, hold on, church, you're, you're to be different from the world around you as you embrace the reality that the end of all things is at hand and life is short and the last day is coming sooner than you might have anticipated. Be self controlled. Be sober-minded, don't freak out. Here's the point, don't miss this. This is a spoiler alert for you. At the end of the day, at the end of all things, Jesus wins. Church, at the end of the day, on the last day, at the end of all things, Jesus wins. So that means if you are in Christ, at the end of all things, you win. We need to hear that, right? I mean, I, I, all the time we hear these conversations of, of people worried, freaking out about the things that are happening, that are showing we are coming closer and closer to the end of days. But church, if you are in Christ, the closer you get to the end of days, the closer you get to the culmination of victory that is yours in Christ. So live self-controlled. And sober-minded for the sake of your prayers, Peter says. What does that mean? He's saying pray with this in mind. God, help me to make the most of the days I've been given. God, help me to be reminded that life is short and I have an opportunity today to live for your glory. God, help me to live today in light of eternity and God when I'm prone to fear or when I'm prone to worry or when I feel like I'm starting to freak out as I'm reminded of how short life is and how the end of all things is rapidly approaching remind me of the victory that I have in Jesus it's a powerful prayer it really points us back to an amazing statement that the Apostle Paul makes in the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 21. I think this is one of the more challenging statements in all of the scripture for a follower of Jesus to live out. But it is a powerful, powerful statement. The Apostle Paul says this, for, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How do you say that statement? The way the Apostle Paul can say that statement is because he says, I am confident, I am confident that my life has been built upon the finished work of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And that means, that means on the worst day that I have in this life, I still have hope. To live is Christ. My Savior wins. And because I'm in Christ, I will win because of what Christ has given me. On the worst day, I still have hope to live as Christ and to die as gain. What does that mean? That means on my final day, on my last day, when I breathe my last and I step into the reality of eternity that is waiting for me, I will be stepping into a reality that is better than my best day in this life. To die is gain. Praise be to God. To live is Christ and to die is gain. Is that the reality that you have embraced as you look at the world around you? Is that the reality that you have embraced as you think about your story and your circumstance? Peter is calling the church here to make the most 
of the time that we have been given because the time is short. And then he provides some, some teaching, some instruction for how the church can live this out among each other. These are some one another's that we see here in the word of God. Verse eight of First Peter chapter four, Peter takes us back to, to the, the defining characteristic of a follower of Jesus according to Jesus himself. And he tells the church, we are to love one another. First Peter four, eight, above all, Keep, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Again, think about this. Peter heard what Jesus said about love. He was there when, when Jesus gave that great teaching to his disciples uh, about love. I want to give you an example of this. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Well, what does Jesus say about love? He says, hey, I've got a commandment for you. This is, this is a new commandment that I'm giving to you if you are my disciple. He says, just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. And then I love this. I love this statement. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Peter builds on that and says, above all, Love one another earnestly. Keep on living this call of Christ on his followers to love one another. What is this all about here? This is so significant and it's, it's, it's so profound and yet so simple that we often just kind of move past it. The defining characteristic of a Christian life is to be love. We are to be known for our love of one another. Think about why this is so significant here in 1 Peter chapter 4. Because Peter has just been reminding us the world may not understand you if you are a follower of Christ. The world may not agree with you if you are a follower of Christ. In fact, we looked at this last week. The world might malign you or come against you or cause suffering for you simply because you follow Christ. And even as the world may not understand you, may not agree with you, may come against you because you are a follower of Christ, when they look at you, they should see a love that is so unusual and so compelling and so different from the world around them that it's unavoidable. The defining characteristic of a follower of Jesus is to be loved. We are to be known for our love for one another. The world should look at the church and see a love that is so unusual that it stands out. And Peter is saying, this love, this love that is rooted and grounded in the love that God has given us through Christ, when it is lived out, it has a powerful and profound impact. What does he say? Verse 8, he says, this love covers a multitude of sins. What, what does that mean? Love covers a multitude of sins. Here we're being reminded that Christian love is to be a grace-filled, forgiving love. Christian love is a grace-filled, forgiving love. I love what Wayne Grudem writes about this. He says, where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some large ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion. Every action is liable to misunderstanding and conflicts abound, listen, to Satan's perverse delight. Now church, we don't need to be reminded of this because we see it every day, but it's true. We live in a world that is always suspicious. We live in a world that is looking for misunderstanding that it can pounce upon. 
We live in a world that is looking for offense and taking notes and taking names. We live in a world that is constantly keeping score of all the wrongs that have been done to them so that the world can cancel those who have offended them. And the scripture is saying to the people of God, it must not be so with you. This is a very unusual kind of love that the word of God is pointing to, a grace-filled forgiving love that does not lead with suspicion, that does not look for offenses, that does not hold grudges, but instead chooses to forgive, chooses to extend grace because of what has been given to us. Love one another earnestly, for love covers a multitude of sins. Isn't that exactly what the gospel shows us? Isn't that exactly what Jesus has done for you? So here's the question. Are you you constantly searching for offenses? Are you constantly viewing everyone with suspicion and intentionally being offended by misunderstanding and holding grudges against those who have wronged you or, or, Are you inviting love, the love that is yours through Christ, to to be your guide as you offer grace and forgiveness and allow love to cover a multitude of sins? This is a love that stands out. But then we see Peter turn our attention to hospitality. He, He shows us the importance in the church for the people of God to be a people who show hospitality. He makes it very clear. He, he, he writes, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, what is Peter saying here? Well, Peter is saying, be like Chick-fil-A, don't be like McDonald's. <laughs> it's the GSV, again, the George Standard Version. There it is, right? Show hospitality. And delight in showing hospitality. Why? Well, in the fast food world, I believe Chick-fil-A can delight in showing hospitality because they have the best product out there. I'm just, I'm just saying. Nobody's paying me with that, but if you want to give me a free chicken sandwich, I'll take it. I love Christian chicken. <laughs> Please don't miss this. In the church of Jesus Christ, we have the greatest news that the world could ever hear. We should take delight, please hear this, we should take delight in inviting others into this good news. We should take delight in inviting one another into this good news. Hospitality is something that that the church should be known for. And many of you have experienced great hospitality. I'm so thankful for our hospitality team here uh, at Shades, our first impression team, our, our green team that says, hey, we want you here. You're invited here. You belong here. You're part of the family here. Come on in and receive this gift that we have received. I know many of you have have traveled on short-term mission trips. It's my hope and my prayer that all of you, if you have not been on a short-term mission trip, would go at some point in the near future. Because one of the things you encounter when you you travel on a short-term mission trip, especially to a different country with a different culture, is the hospitality of the people of God is absolutely overwhelming. I have spent the night in complete strangers' homes in Peru and in Uganda. I have had meals in complete strangers' homes in Haiti and in Singapore and in Malaysia. I have been invited into complete strangers' homes in the Middle East. The only thing I had in common with them, the only thing I had in common with them was a relationship with Jesus Christ. They said, come in, stay with us. Have a meal with us. Fellowship with us. You are invited here because of what Christ has done for me. 
the gift of hospitality, it is compelling, it is contagious, it is inviting, and the church of Jesus Christ is to be the most hospitable group of people that the world could ever interact with. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Why why is that statement there? Because hospitality is always inconvenient. And hospitality is always going to cost you something. And it's possible that you could serve someone, even invite someone in without being nice, without being kind, actually being frustrated that you have to do it, more out of duty and obligation than out of love. And so Peter's saying, no, no, no. The hospitality of the people of God, it needs to be a hospitality driven by love. There's no room for complaining among the people of God. Show hospitality without grumbling. And then this is where we land today, verses 10 and 11. We're reminded of this beautiful truth that has shown up all throughout this letter that the people of God are called to live for the glory of God. First Peter chapter four, verses 10 through 11 says it this way. As each, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. Whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever. Peter is saying, if you are a follower of Christ, you have been given gifts by God for one purpose, to point to the glory of God. The gifts that you have been given by the Spirit of God, they're not about you. They are about the giver. They are to point back to the one who has entrusted to you these gifts that you might live for his glory. So the way we say it around here at Shades is, so leverage your life for the sake of the gospel wherever you are and wherever God takes you because God has entrusted to you a beautiful gift. Be a steward of this gift gift and live for the glory of God. It cannot be any more clear here. Peter is showing us the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, exist for the glory of God in everything, the scripture says. In everything, we are to live for this purpose, for the glory of God, because all glory belongs to him. May we never be those who are attempting to use what God has entrusted to us to steal some glory, to steal some authority, to take what only belongs to him and try to claim it for ourselves. No, we are to steward what God has entrusted us. You know, this is why Jesus, in his teachings, he he talks about giving more than pretty much any other topic. Now, I'm talking about financial giving here. I know this might make some of us a little uncomfortable, but, but, but Jesus talks about giving, and the reason he does so is to show us that everything we have is a gift from God that's been entrusted to us by God, and we are to return back a portion of what God has given to us in a very intentional, excuse me, specific way, which is why the Bible talks about a tithe, which is 10% of whatever we make, we're to bring it right back to the Lord, right off the top, the first fruits brought to the Lord. Why is that, why is that habit talked about? Why is that discipline talked about? It feels so invasive. It's talked about because it's supposed to show us every single day, at every single paycheck, and everything that's entrusted to us, it belongs to God. He gave it to me. I'm a steward of what he has entrusted to me. So right off the top, I return a portion to remind my heart that it's not mine to begin with. Because giving is always a heart issue. Always. Living for the glory of God is always a heart issue. Always. So the word of God reminds us, bring a portion back to the Lord 
so that your heart does not grow hard, so that you don't attempt to rob glory from God or authority from God because all glory and dominion or authority belong to him. Live for the glory of God. This is the calling on the people of God. And Peter gives us two examples and then we'll, we'll close here today. He says, when you speak, if you're one who speaks on behalf of God or to point to God, you must be reminded you are speaking the oracles of God. What is this all about? Peter says, look, whenever you open your mouth, whenever you stand and speak, if you're a follower of Jesus, whatever you say, whatever you say, should point back to the truth of God's word. I live in this reality as one who stands up to speak week in and week out. I must have an ongoing understanding that when we gather together and you listen to me speak, you're actually not here to listen to me speak. You're not here for my opinion. You're not here because I, I, I can hold somebody's attention. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I think I might could hold your attention without talking about the word of God. I, I might even could get, make you feel like you've been entertained without the word of God. I might even could make you uh, uh, feel like you need to change something in your life without the word of God. And if I do that, I will have to answer to God. Because the word of God has made it clear that when you speak as a follower of Jesus, especially when you stand to speak before others as if representing God, that you must keep in mind at all times you are speaking oracles of God, which means you must make sure that whatever you are speaking goes right back to the word of God. Because what I have to say doesn't matter a lick for eternity. What God has to say matters infinitely in eternity. And we want to make sure that whenever we speak, we speak to point back to the truth of who God is, what he has done, and what he has said in his word. Peter talks about serving. He says, when you serve, you're, you're to serve in such a way that it makes it obvious this is God's strength in you, not your strength doing something that you can take credit for. When you serve according to the strength God supplies, it's to all be done for the glory of God. Speak for the glory of God. Serve for the glory of God. All glory and dominion belong to him forever and ever, amen. Juan Sanchez in his commentary on these verses writes this, and I'll close with this. We glorify God by living a normal, ordinary Christian life, which is the life of a believer who knows the end is near, who keeps his or her head, who prays hard, loves well, welcomes much, and uses their gifts for the church. If you live like that, God is glorified in you because you display Christ's work in and through you. This is the calling on a follower of Jesus. The word of God is reminding us that the last day is rapidly approaching and as the people of God, we are called to live like it. Make the most of the time. Leverage your life for the glory of God. And if you are here today and you are unsure of whether or not you are prepared for the last day, I've got really good news for you you can know in confidence that you are ready for the last day if you trust your life to Jesus Christ. So I wanna pray over us now as we close this message. I wanna pray for the church, but I also wanna pray specifically for those of you today who might feel unsure or even concerned, thinking, 
I'm not ready for the last day. If that's you, you can be ready today. You can be ready by trusting in Jesus. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for what your word lays before us. I'm so thankful for the challenge that you bring to the church in light of the gift that the church has received. So Lord, I pray that that we would live in light of this good news, that we would live in light of what we have been given through Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord God, that the people of Shades Mountain would continue to be a people who live in light of eternity, who continue to be a people who point to the hope that we have in Christ. Lord, please use us to that end, to make the most of each day, and to live for your glory in all things. And Father, as we close our time with an eye fixed on eternity, as we close our time being reminded of the the brevity of this life and being reminded that the the last day is rapidly approaching, Lord, I know for some that that can be uh, an anxiety-inducing thought. I know there are some among us who, if they are honest, would say, I am not ready for that day. I I don't even think I understand what it means to to, to be ready to stand before God or to be ready to to face the the, the judgment of God. How do we we deal with that? Lord, I pray for anyone who's wrestling with that right now, for anyone who knows they're not prepared for the final day. Lord, I pray that their eyes would be open to the beautiful gift of the gospel that says Jesus Christ has done for you what you could never do for yourself. Jesus Christ has given his life on a cross to pay for your sin so that you can be forgiven and through the power of his resurrection, you can be made alive in Christ forevermore. You can have hope for all of eternity through Jesus Christ. And so I pray for those today who know they need to begin this relationship. Would you give them the faith to say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I trust you. Forgive me. I'm ready to follow you and I'm ready to know that I have hope for all of eternity. Jesus, I trust you. Father, we praise you for what you're doing among people all around this place. As people are growing in their faith, as people are trusting you in faith, we celebrate. We thank you for this beautiful good news that gives us hope for eternity. And so we worship you in spirit and truth. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and let's sing in response to this good news, this gospel news. Let's sing in response to what the word of God has laid before us. And if you're here today and and you know you need someone to pray with you before you go, some of our ministerial staff will be right down front here. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to be able to lift you up to the living God through prayer. If you're here today and you know you need to begin a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you just prayed with me when I was praying that 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 relationship would start for you today, we would invite you to come and, and find one of our ministerial team down front, either as we're singing or at the end of the service. Let us pray over you as you begin the most important relationship that you will ever enter into. Let's lift our voices now as we celebrate the good news of the gospel.